Stimmt der Name? Right, so hi guys. Today we're doing a podcast about how games affect your kids. <laughs> um, so we got Connor, Chris, well, wow. yep, uh, Justin, yeah. and your am- amazing host Alex. Um, <laughs> so what do you guys think about how games affect kids in today's society? Stuff thing. <laughs> so, like what? <coughs> well. Get video games are becoming a very big addiction for kids these days, you know. And they're up there with a the list with alcohol and drugs, but it's pretty strong. Do you, do you say it's as bad as drugs and alcohol? Um, I'd say the addiction is, is quite as strong as both of them because, you know, the strong hardcore gamers, they, they never put down a controller or the, or the mouse, you know. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, never stopped. that's true for the effects from doing drugs and alcohol are different oh, yeah, to video games. Games can kill you and shit, you know, like. Oh yeah, yeah. Just, just language, like Chris. That. Family friendly, Connor. <laughs> okay, um, poo. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Right, you go, Chris. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about how games affect kids uh, these days? I mean, it could be a bad influence for young kids because for me, it taught me like to swear. Like, <laughs> I know that's a weird thing to say. Cursing words. It did. Like <laughs> the community on some games are, are pretty toxic. And that could like affect like how a kid grows up. So you'd say the online part of it's very different to like an actual Solo, yeah. point of the game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's understandable. What about you, Justin? What are your thoughts on this? Well, going to the whole nature nurture thing. Oh yeah. Um, quite a lot of kids instead of spending time with their family, they play games. Yeah. So they've been nurtured by games. Yeah. And in nature, they may be nice kids, but because of games, they may mm. turn out violent for a short period of time after playing the game. Yeah. And in for the rest of life. But so yeah, say if I had um, if I had nature, but I had good nurture, would that be a different outcome? Would I still be if I played a game and I went proper cray cray? <laughs> would would that be its equivalent? Um, possibly yes, as you're bad by nature, and if it's harder, I would say if you you're bad by nature to be nurtured to good. Yeah. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna go on to one of our games, which is called Life is Strange, um, and there's a main character called M- Max, I believe, um, and Cole is a very close companion. Um, but through that game, there can be times where you could call their relationship as heterosexual on levels. What's your verdict, guys? Well, see, it all depends on how you play out the game. If you treat Warren, one of the friends of Chloe and Max, um, if you treat him as a friend and choose to kiss Chloe when she dares you, it ends up as a romantic relationship and they kiss at the end. If you persuade Warren and don't kiss Chloe, they just become incredibly close friends. So you would say that they're, they're treating both sides here that you can choose who you want to be. That's true, man. That is true. Very, so you're very not, true. not being one-sided. Yeah, you need to choose your path. Okay, well... Um, through the game, uh, I think that you and Justin have both looked into this. Uh, do you mind explaining the story and plot of Life is Strange in a rough detail? Um, so you start as a high school girl, and basically it's a choice-filled <laughs> game. Um, but these choices aren't like your normal um, sort of Walking Dead sort of choice. Yeah. Like, um, telltale games um, but it's more you do something and then you can rewind time and then change it if you want so if that part of rewinding time was removed would you make more like your decisions more carefully or would you just still go through them the same way as you would if you could rewind time um, I reckon that you'll choose decisions more carefully because Obviously, when you can rewind time, you can uh, you don't really think that much, you know, because you can still rewind and just choose your path again, you know. Whereas if you don't have that rewind aspect, aspect, then yeah, you know, you choose carefully because you know you can't go back and change things, you know. So you have to choose much more carefully. Yeah, I believe there's a scene where a uh, sad topic of a girl jumps off the top of the roof. Oh yeah. And um, m- most people' outcome is they uh, they push her to do it, but if the part that they could couldn't rewind time wasn't there most of them I'm guessing would say they wouldn't want to do that true um, going on to the next one um, 
as Max is the only character that can change time, does that show any sexism to how females are unstable? I haven't gone off that one. You don't. Mm. Well, um, I wouldn't say that it um, portrays her unstable. It's just a power she has, which yeah. is just by chance. Okay. Um, and to the game, how's Max's relationship with her parents as she's going through her teenage years? I can't remember what it is now. Where is it? Ah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, verdict? Max has quite a good relationship with her parents. Her parents care for her deeply. This is quite clearly seen due to their uh, separate birthday texts and her mother's encouraging texts at various points in this episode. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Max's mother also gets a special mention as Max talks about the coconut bite in her bedroom, mm. revealing that she got a two hundred dollar gift with her, with uh, with them for her birthday. She likes her dad quite a lot. Uh, no, wait. Yeah. One second. She likes her dad quite a lot, like when she talks about when they go to the hockey game together to support the Seattle Thunderbirds. Well, I guess that means that she's got a very good relationship. Yeah. And uh, is it her best friend, Chloe? Uh, yes, I believe so. Yes. Uh, I believe her father died in a, a car accident. Does this uh, show any effects on Chloe as a teenager? And does that prove to any unstable factors? Um, well, when Chloe's father died, in the car crash, she did change quite a bit because when her father died, Chloe, uh, no, not Chloe, Max moved to um Seattle with her parents, and uh, basically it left Chloe with no one except for her mum, yeah. and her and her mum they were okay, but they weren't the best, you know. And then um a man came along, um I th I believe his name was David Madsen, yeah, that's it. And um when her her mum and David got married, um. Chloe despised him very much, very much so. And then, um, and then when this happened, she became very rebellious, a teenager. Like she went out sneaking out, doing drugs, hanging out with the bad boys, you know. Yeah, that sort of thing. The bad, the bad girl. Yeah. So I guess if people were there for her, she would have chosen a path differently, you know. But because her father died and and Max moved away, she had no one there to like come yeah. through. You know? Well, uh, looking through the the school in Life is Strange, do you see how religion is shown through that school? Um, there was a character called Kate. She was um, she was born into a heavily a, he a heavy Christian family, and um, throughout the game, it shows the main uh, the main religion in the game is Chris uh, Christianity, because there aren't really any evidence of any other religion out there except for Christianity. But, um, there are quite a few characters, like, um, one second, I'll get there. Yeah, uh, Kate, oh, oh, wait, we've got Justin over here. You sure? Okay. Uh, um, we got Kate, uh, obviously the Christian. Uh, her father is a, um, a preacher in the church as well. And there's two other characters in the game uh, called Frank Boyers and someone else. Can't remember the name. Frank Boyers. And yeah, they're shown to us. Uh, be believed in God and stuff, but yeah, that's the only religion there really is in that game. Okay. Well, to sum up, life is strange. I feel like that uh, they're not really targeting a group of people as such, but uh, there are a few loose ends, as you could say. Yeah, loose ends, indeed. But um, I want to move on to a game called Doom now, um, and I'm sure everyone understands the the story of Doom, and I'm sure Justin would love to explain that story. Yeah, of course. So. Um, we were talking about the 2016 version of Doom, which was a remake of the first one. It's where um, basically a group of very powerful people set up a company on Mars called the UAC to um, take power from hell. And that resulted in opening up a portal to hell and the demons came through and invaded the facility which meant that they had to wake up the Doomslayer, which is a powerful being from an old world, and he hates demons. As you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, because he, in the book, it says that in, as his son died, he asked for the demons to raise him again, but they brought him back as a demon, 
and he was angered by that. And then the demons also, because the, of the power of his son, they could take over um, the Doomslayer's homeland. So, and that's why he hates demons. Well, that's uh, very summed up. But um, so going back to when the UAC um, was set up and they wanted to get power from hell, would you say they were invading hell, or were they defending themselves from hell? I'd, I'd say it's a bit of both. So you'd say the UAC is the invading factor here, that the hell are defending themselves and they don't really want to butch everyone as such. Okay. Yeah, I would say. Um, so the Special Force Marine, or the main character, is Doomslayer, is that right? Um, is there any reason for his hidden identity or to keep his gender neutral? Um, not particularly, but... Um he was never named, so it was, um, and it was said by the developers to make the game more immersive, yeah. so it could be anyone, like it's just a guy in a suit. Yeah, so it could be female or male, so it's not being gender specific. No. Okay. Well, um, is Doom too violent? I wouldn't say um, Doom is too violent, but this is from the perspective of someone who played a few violent games. So when you look at the original Doom and you look at Doom 2 that's been released, you wouldn't say that there's a big step up in the gore factor and that uh, there's no real peace treaty going on between those? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say that. But it's to be expected in a Doom game because, and with the evolution of graphics as well, it just seems more violent even though it may just be the same amount of violence but with more detail. Um, is a good one. Uh, how can you distinguish a violent action in a game compared to a violent action in the real world? Well, in the case of Doom, um, it, I would say it's quite easy to distinguish the violence in that game from real life, as most normal people um, can't crush someone's skull or <laughs> rip off the limbs of someone, so it's a bit far-fetched from reality. Well, this is a, a question open to everyone, but uh, music in games, especially in Doom, how like how the music affects how people react to a, a kill or doing oh, something yeah. correct. Light motifs. How do you feel like, do you think that's a good factor of a game, having light motifs, or you, do you think it should be dulled down a bit? Hmm. I'd say the music is pretty out there in Doom, you know? It is a pretty good soundtrack. Yeah, it's a pretty good soundtrack. It get, gets people very hyped up, you know? when you're playing the game certain levels the music like really hyped up when you start killing people you know gets the adrenaline rushing in people you know yeah uh, yeah high tempo um equals uh, increased adrenaline uh, that's uh, the fact well i'd like to move on to uh call of duty franchise now and um i know chris is very happy yeah, now Mark, yeah. so um this is going to be a bit of a broad question just try and <laughs> sum up the whole of call of duty mm -hmm. in just like a few Few, few lines. Okay, so Call of Duty is a massive franchise uh, based on lots of different wars and eras. But uh, it's all a first-person shooter where you play as a, a male character that goes and like either saves the day or rescues people, stuff like that. Okay. Well, I know that there's lots of parts of Call of Duty that have been uh, looked down on as bad and represented badly. Mm -hmm. um, but the one that's most known is um, for Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, the mission No Russia, where yep. you have to prove yourself to the Russian Mafia by shooting up an airport full of innocent people. What do you make of this, and do you think it still should be a part of that game? Uh, it's key to the storyline because you're um, undercover, so, I mean, it should be kept in, but it is a very controversial topic because you do go and shoot, like, uh, innocent civilians. But uh, there is a point where you can... Even though you still be a part of it, you can uh you can choose to not shoot the civilians, like as the undercover agent, and just watch the like the people you're with shoot them. So, but you're still going to be a part of that massacre, yeah, yeah. whatever you do. So for the, do you think that there was no better way to show uh, like you're loyal to the Russian mafia without shooting up an airport full of innocent people? Uh, they could have changed the storyline so that you <laughs> never had to go to the airport in the first place and like avoid that whole situation. But from the way they set it out, you like. Well, it's hard to avoid it without, like, not being able to show your face. Yeah, because I understand that at the start of that mission, there's a, a warning um, mm -hmm. about the, the upcoming mission. Um, but most people who still accepted that still looked down on it as a, a mission that should be removed. 
Mm. But um, moving on to my next one. Uh, now I understand that uh, the wars that Call of Duty is set in are very brutal and many lives were lost. But too many people playing this game is, uh, don't use it as an educational resource, more of a joy source, correct? Yes, that's correct. So you feel like that people who play Call of Duty are less likely to play games that are more sci-fi based. It's meant, um, Call of Duty is meant to be a, a casual game, which is uh, where a lot of the community sticks to multiplayer. And it's like, never really to... F nowadays it's not really to focus as much in the game, but more on like people you play with. Uh, it's more of a play with your friends kind of game nowadays. Yeah, it's understandable. So you think that uh, if you're going to buy this game, be more for the online part. Social aspect, yeah. Social aspect. Okay. Well, um, out of the whole COD series, uh, I believe that they've all been 18, age rating. Uh, and the only one that wasn't was Call of Duty Ghosts, which yes. was a 16 plus. Do you think that they should stay or they should stay like that? Or do you think any should be lowered? Or um, You could argue that the first three games could be uh, lowered in age rating purely because the graphic quality is like really bad and you can't tell like a kill's a kill. Yeah. But uh, from like all the like cur current ones and like the one that's coming out this year, they should definitely stay at an 18 because the gore is there and the violence and mind control stuff there. Yeah, so uh, more of an open question to people now that um, if I had a, a, you say a 12 year old kid um, and I was letting him play 18 games, how do you think that's going to affect his like, upbringing? Do you think he's going to see um, like people as different if he plays Call of Duty and shooting types of people? Do you think that's going to affect who he is when he's older? Uh, I reckon I reckon to give him different views as he's growing up. Because obviously when you're younger, like that young, your brain's still developing, still developing like personality and stuff. And um, obviously when you're going to play a game like Call of Duty, you know, shooting people up and seeing that sort of thing, going to change the way he sort of sees the world, you know. Mm. So you think yeah. that uh, <laughs> uh, that you should stick to these age ratings? Yeah, definitely stick to the age ratings. Eh? There's a reason why they're there. The reason why Peggy put the 18 on that case is so the, the age is strictly 18 and above, you know, nothing younger. Yeah, to try and help people uh, separate reality from games. Yeah. So even though I know there's, uh, there's games are uh, rated for three-year-olds and and kids that are super young, do you think that there should be a, a limit where kids should just not play? They should go outside and live their life. Mm. To um to better social interaction, like outside, like when you're growing up, if you like go out, like join clubs, like a sport, for example, then that's gonna. Yeah better than sitting in your room like talking at a screen because that wouldn't help like much at all yeah well i can say that I, I i've played a lot of games but i didn't start playing games until i was 14 and as as, as much as i hated my parents when that was happening i feel like that the fact that i was able to get out and socialize with people is a better factor than getting locked up in my room and playing games mm. i feel that, that there should be a a, a, a very well balanced factor between playing a game and getting consumed with it. Okay. Well, I'd like to add to that. Um, even though, like you were saying, there's a balance. Like yeah. um, most esports players, so like um, CS:GO and stuff yeah. like that, um, they're all quite active. So they don't just sit at their computers all the time. Um, they do go out and they have a large social life. Mm, but on the majority, you see people who are. At our age, like 16, 17, that are uh, pro gamers, as they want to call themselves, do you see them with much social life? Like, do they get out? Mm. No, not really. As um, most of their time spent talking on computer. Yeah, that's what I mean. I feel that it needs to be a, a well balanced. And when you're growing up, having images of shooting people, like playing GTA, where you're going down every corner and you find some stripper on the side, it's very. Um, yeah, he gives a bad impression to the kids, and I feel like that should be changed. Has anyone got any um, thoughts against that? Uh, or, or I, do you I say it's true, you know. I think kids should go outside, enjoy life, and mm. not be hidden behind a computer screen all their life, you know? No. I feel like the addition of uh, like parental controls to it, like consoles and PCs, help. Like when they like set like limits, like a couple of hours or that, just so that yeah. they have the time and they're forced to come off. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. But we can roll back to a an event where a kid played Manhunt with his friend, and he ended up killing his friend because he's been obsessed with that game. Do you think that getting obsessed with a game 
and not leaving it's going to lead to you know factors like that where kids are going to be out of control and they're going to do things that to them seems normal because they've been brought up with a life of seeing like brutal murders killings and whether it's on a game or not it's still something that's affecting them i reckon it'll bring bring out some effect in the real world because obviously if you're an obs- uh, obsessive gamer like he was you know you play that game for ages like non-stop mm. then it will cause some some outcome in real life you know like all those things you've been seeing all those slaughters and stuff it's going to make him take that out on action in real life so yeah. i reckon it'd be the same for other people too so. mm. well uh I, I think i've got a good idea and understanding of all of these have you got anything else you would like to add well i'd go back to the whole nature versus nurture thing yeah um in some some people's nature they're more susceptible to games so the whole manhunt thing he may have just been very susceptible to what he sees yeah so rather than so he might have had a bad nature and a bad nurture yeah. but I, I guess it is a, a list of you can have bad nature bad nurture you can have like experiences that have, have troubled you and things like that but everyone's ticking one or two of those off at what point would you say people need to be like put on a, a, a watch list as such for having that type of background in playing games like that um, I would say it's quite hard to tell as well when you're playing a game most mm. people are alone yeah. and it's not unless you play like on a console or something it's not something you but still do in a room. It, it may be a social like mm. fact that you still it's nothing like meeting people in real life and speaking to them face to face as much as you love Call of Duty, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I I I think that uh, you've got to be able to tell your kids no that you can't play this. You just need to go out and enjoy your life. It's it's no bad thing. I reckon there should be more par- parental control with these games, because um, all those kids out there, like the younger kids, they come straight in from school, get dressed, and then spend the rest of their night playing games. Or even older teenagers like us and spend most of their time playing video games and stuff. And if they don't live with their parents, I reckon the parents should have like a, I don't know, a set time, so you know, like a couple of hours on games, shut it off, turn the internet off if they have to, and then force them to go outside, you know? Because playing video games non stop isn't really gonna, gonna help you in life. So. For our age, should we not be old enough to know when to stop? I know, I mean, we should be old enough to know, but For if we're not old enough, I mean, you've got people out there that will tell you what, when's enough. Yeah. yeah. Well, going for a personal factor, when you get home, do you guys just do you go out? Do you do you work then play, or do you do work and go out? I usually play a video game like lasting at night, around eight o'clock. Come off about well, play games like three or four hours, maybe not that much. But sometimes not even that. But I do other things before, you know, like go to work or go out and socialize, yeah. you know. Yeah. What about you two? Yeah, I um work quite a lot of the time, so. That has a big social aspect. Yeah, yeah, we can still get out from it. What about you, Chris? Uh, well, I, I do, I um, I'm pretty bad at this. Uh, I tend to, like, get, keep up with one of my hobbies, which is like exercising and running. Yeah. And then, like, most of the time, I do generally go and spend time on my Xbox. Yeah, so you like, you like getting consumed by like a few things. Yeah, I do notice the fact that I don't spend like enough family time or social time outside. So you think that like relationships with families can really get knocked by playing games? Yeah, you don't spend enough time with them, so. Yeah, well, I think that that is something that kids do need to understand that, as as sad as it will be, your family might not be there forever, but your games will. <laughs> yep. Um, and also the fact that, yes, you may realise that sometimes you're gaming a bit too much, but there's no obvious consequences that you can see. Yeah. So it's just you playing games, which is what you enjoy. Yeah. And nothing really happens after no yeah i guess i add on to that it's kind of it's not as obvious to us because if you're for like gamers for example if they're playing forever and their parents are complaining they ain't seen their kids enough the gamers aren't going to really notice that because yeah. they're enjoying themselves they're not really bothered about seeing their parents but in the long run they're going to notice eventually that when they were younger playing all these games and stuff they didn't have the love from their parents and didn't see their parents as much as they should have so. yeah it's only until it's like too late that you realise like mistakes you make. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, I think that we've uh, gone through everything we wanted to. Unless you have guys, you guys have got anything else to say? I'm all good for wrapping this up. No, I'm all good. Yeah, yeah, I'm you good. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, 
think that uh, we've got a good understanding that kids need to know the fine line between playing games and having a life. So, um, thank you guys for listening. Please subscribe now. Bye. Plug one. <laughs>